They're, they're both at 1080p right now. So, who knows? All right, so if you want to follow along, that's where the slides are, since they look like crap on the projector. I would only ask that you don't fast forward too fast from what I'm talking, because then you miss the punchlines. And Joe, you need to behave. Okay, so swap as a service. What on earth is this dumb idea? So who here has ever heard of dev null as a service? Has anybody heard of that before? Joe, I know you have, because we've talked about it before. So dev null as a service is a joke that somebody made, I don't know how long ago, um, because of all the things being turned into a service that a company can pay for instead of doing themselves, they created a website for dev null as a service. So if, you, if your company's capacity of piping stuff to dev null wasn't sufficient, you could pay him and then he would happily be your dev null service. So this is basically, I was like, well, swap as a service is something I haven't seen. And it's equally as ridiculous because, well, you know, memory, paying someone else for memory doesn't seem like a bad idea or seems like a bad idea. So the first two questions for any talk is who am I? And why should you listen to me? So I am JT Pennington. Um, I work for IX Systems. I do automation testing, release engineering, and security analysis of TrueNAS and TrueCommand. I'm also the lead Lumina desktop developer now. I run the Fedora security team because I volunteered myself like an idiot because I had too much to do and I thought, hey, what would be great is if I did some more stuff that I don't have time for. Um, I'm also the producer of several uh, podcasts and an FM radio show, The Ask Noah Show, which is right down at the corner of the hall. You've probably all seen Noah while you've been here. You should stop by and say hi. Uh, and I do a bunch of other things as well. Historically, I was always the same person, just in case there was any confusion. I haven't changed. Um, I used to be a puppy Linux developer, and I was the producer of the Linux Action Show, Linux Unplugged, and I used to be a security consultant. And like now, I also did a lot of other things. So why should you listen to me? Well, you probably shouldn't. Um, just to be clear, uh, and this, this next gift pretty much sums it up as clear as I can. So I like to do stupid things just to get a laugh. Um, as the people here that know me or have talked to me, I have a lot of weird equipment that I like doing weird things with because it's just enjoyable. And some of that turns into talks like this. So you guys get to benefit from me being ridiculous. Um, so why am I doing this? Well, as I said, I'm kind of retarded a little bit, and I want a system that no one makes. So if you go to buy a computer, a server, whatever, there are pretty much two categories you're gonna fall into. You can buy a desktop or a workstation that will have a few very fast CPU cores, but you'll have a limited amount of memory. Your other option is to buy a server where you have a lot of cores, but they're a lot slower, but you can have a lot of memory. What I want is a system with a few CPU cores that are very fast and all the memory. Unfortunately, no one sells this product. You can't go buy this. So every time I do have to go buy a system, this is typically the attitude I have towards AMD and Intel because they refuse to give me a system that will work the way I want. And also, I just really wanted to use this GIF somehow because I love the idea of a guy in a bunny suit just beating the snot out of somebody. That makes me laugh. So the next question is, okay, well, how much RAM do I actually have? And the answer to that is I have oodles. So for a little bit of an example here, uh, my current workstation is limited to 64 gig RAM. The server that I have hanging on my wall has 256 gig, and it's mostly just collecting dust. Um, and actually, I was going through my slides last night. That's not entirely true. I actually have two. Um, this server right here has 256 gig, and this server right here has 256 gig. So technically there's 512 on my wall collecting dust. And as much as it's fun to have a nice little art wall of all the motherboards, which by the way, those all do work, I can pull them down and use them, 
it's not really efficient or useful to have all that RAM just sitting there collecting dust. Now, the board that I'm using for this talk is this one right here. And the one that you actually see in the picture without CPU coolers is this one. This is a board by ASUS. It's an Ivy Bridge board. Um, I'll put this at any time during the conference if you want to. Just yell at me and I'll come bring this out. Um, this can handle up to, I think it's 768 gig. But the one on my wall only has 256. So what I want to be able to do is take the RAM that is on the server and use it on my desktop as if it is local RAM right there able to be used. Now, the obvious question is, well, how are you going to do that? They're completely different systems. Well, one of the nice things about the Unix philosophy is there's a whole bunch of small tools that are built and designed to do one thing. You're supposed to do it well. And as you chain these things together, you end up with possibilities that you normally wouldn't have if you sat down to just write a single tool to do a single thing, because the combination of all these becomes exponential. And that is exactly what I did. Um, I have a lot of InfiniBand cards that were given to me from places that I have friends that work at that they were trying to liquidate their old stock or stuff they weren't using anymore. So I have plenty of network, I have plenty of old servers, plenty of RAM. I just need to bolt all this stuff together and figure out software to actually be able to take advantage of it. Now, that being said, this is not a perfect solution. This is very hacky. Um, I'm warning you now, um, if, if you don't like cringe, the door is right back there because this, this does, it is a little gnarly. It, it works, but it's a little gnarly. So don't come to me afterwards complaining that, oh, that was a bad implementation. I'm telling you, this is a bad implementation and you probably shouldn't do this. So, first let's talk about InfiniBand. InfiniBand is a, it's another type of networking technology that exists and is mostly used in data centers and high performance clusters. One of the benefits of InfiniBand is beyond its high bandwidth, is that you have kind of a guaranteed latency between every hop. Because when you're building a cluster, packets from one system to another, you need to be able to calculate and rely that getting from point A to point B is going to be about the same amount of time. And that if a packet goes through five other nodes, it doesn't matter what five nodes it's going to go through, that latency between the packet being sent and received at the destination is going to be about the same. Most modern ConnectX2 cards from Mellanox will do both Ethernet and InfiniBand. You just have to set which mode it is. The ConnectX2 cards will do 40 gig IB and 10 gig. And the ConnectX3 will do 56 gig IB and 40 gig ETH. And you can pick these up on eBay for pretty cheap. The, the ConnectX2, the 40 gig IB, 10 gig ETH, you can probably pick up for $10 a card these days. There's a ton of them and they're dirt cheap. The, 40, the 56 gig and 40, those are probably going to run you about $40 a piece. Um, so if you have a server and you have a workstation or you have two servers and you just want a really big thick pipe between the two, $80 in a DAC cable and congratulations, you have 40 gig ETH between them. Now, as you try to build out your network, it's going to get a lot more complicated because then you're going to need switches and the price of switches are stupid, but we're not doing that. We're doing direct point to point links. Um, so, if you're going to get cards off of eBay or some other reseller, the first thing you need to do is update the card's firmware. Because you definitely want to make sure that your firmware matches so the settings are all set up right. Um, this does not need to be in the talk. I'm going to go through how to update the firmware. The reason I included it is because in a year from now, when I need to do this again on other cards, I want a convenient resource for me to actually go to and remember how to do this. So this is partly for me, well, it's mostly for me. Um, but partly, if anybody else wants to do this dumb science experiment, they can do it as well. So, first, we need to find out the device that we have in our system. And of course, we're going to use LSPCI for that. And then we're going to install MST Flint. That's the software to actually flash to the IB cards. You will pull down whatever the firmware is, wherever it happens to be. For this board, uh, there's the link, which doesn't help you, but it will help me. Um, so, that's why I used it. Unzip it. And then you're going to do the actual command. You're going to MST Flint, the actual device ID you're getting from LSPCI, the binary, and all that. And it's going to show you the current firmware and what you're going to. And at this point, because you're updating firmware that can completely break a device, pray to whatever deity you believe in. And you're going to get this nice warning message that tells you that if this screws up, it, bad things will happen. But if you're lucky, it will succeed, the signatures will check, and you'll be able to reboot. 
And once you reboot, you'll be able to see that, yes, sure enough, I'm on the latest firmware. So now you're good to go. So let's get, up, let's get the networking up between the two machines. Now, my setup, again, is a direct point-to-point -point link over fiber between this motherboard and my workstation. So on the workstation, it's your basic configuration. Set it up, set IPv4, set the gateway, connect the device, do that on both of them. And then I don't know if you guys can actually see this. So no, OK. Well, Jeff, you were late. You see, I had a convenient slide that gave you the GitHub link that you could pull them down and look at them. But yeah. Uh, so basically, I screwed this up because I do that a lot. Um, I learned by trial and error. A lot more trial and error than success, but I get there eventually. Uh, so anyway, the reason, since you can't see this, I won't go through the whole ask, is this screwed up because I didn't do the slash 24, which, as it turns out, is kind of important when you're doing networking. So we get that all configured, we get it set up, and sure enough, we have link. Um, and then, OK, so let's do some tuning. So do some sys controls to change the actual memory values for our read and write max. The Linux kernel is not default on most distributions to do massive networking, because by and large, most people that are using it are not doing big, huge, fat pipes. So you will need to do some search, some searching to find what are going to be the best settings for what networking cards you have and what you're going to do with them, um, because you will be limited out of the gate. We set the MTU, we do a nice iperf, and I get 26 gigabits a second, which that's nice, but I have 40, and I want all 40. I, I paid that you know, rich amount of money of driving to my friend's business to pick up the cards for free. I want everything I paid for. So it turns out that iperf3 is single-threaded. So there's a limit to what it can actually do in a single. So you'll need to do something like this, where you're just doing multiple streams and shoving as much down the pipe. If we do that, we end up with 39.26. So we're right at our 40. Networking is good to go. But now we need to do something with it. Now, there's multiple ways that you can do a networked RAM disk. There's the obvious, where you just create a tempfs on the system, on the server, and then you do an SMB or an NFS mount, and you're good to go. But that, that's good enough for me. I want to do it more stupid, because more stupid is more better. So I decided I was going to use iSCSI, because why not? Um, now, the problem on Linux is that I need a memory device that will behave as a block device. Um, on FreeBSD, memory devices natively handle like a block device. That is not the case on Linux. However, there is a project called RapidDisk, which does exactly this, because the open source community is awesome, and there's always somebody doing something harebrained that I will absolutely take advantage of. So need to get RapidDisk set up. Now, this is where things start to go awry on my little journey here. <coughs> so do not bug the Rocky guys outside the door about this problem, because they are aware of it. Um, and they're, it, it's being worked on-ish. So don't use the minimal ISO if you're going to use Rocky and you're going to try this. Because Rocky is a bug for bug equivalent from Red Hat, they inherit all of the bugs from Red Hat. And Anaconda, while a good installer for very simple things, has some edge cases where it doesn't behave very well. And I landed directly inside of one of them. Um, long story short, when you use the minimal ISO, the metadata for the different repositories doesn't exist on the disk. So when you go to choose a package or a group of packages, it doesn't actually know what to install. Hopefully, this will get fixed upstream in RHEL, and then this can be pulled into Rocky. But let me just go step by step through the process of the fun that I had, because I'm making you all suffer as well. So step one, let's just clone the Git repository. Oh, right, I don't have Git, which is really confusing because I installed the development tools. So manually install Git do the clone, go to build it. Well, wait a second. I don't have dev tools either. Check. Nope. I have the development tools installed. Where are they? Filed a bug. That's how I found out the problem. So remove the development tools and then re-add the development tools. So OK, now I have all the tools I need to actually build this. But there's, of course, dependencies that I need. So install the packages, go to make the package, or go to make the software I'm trying to compile, and I can't because I'm missing a header. Well, that's weird, because I installed the, the header package. 
So why don't I have the header? Can't figure it out. I have the package. I don't have the header. So I'm like, well, screw that. I'll just compile that myself. We're just going to keep going down the tree until eventually I get this to work. So I then pull that in, go to compile it. Oh, well, I can't because that needs something else. Um, anybody who's had fun with dependency hell knows exactly what this is, is you keep stepping down further, further, further into the hole to get the one thing that you need installed. You actually have to install all of this to get this installed. Uh, we're going to return to this point because this is another perfect example of me being an idiot for your entertainment. So I couldn't install libmicro HTTP D because I needed make info. And in order to have make info, I needed text info. So install text info, get the basic stuff. But then it turns out, well, not all of it is in the basic repository because the way Red Hat has segmented the repos, you have the standard repos and then you have EPL. So I have to install the EPL repos. I then enable the power tools. I then pop the stack so I can build, make sure everything's installed, go through and do a make install without sudo, which is going to fail. Um, I do this a lot, and I didn't actually put all of the failures in here of me doing this. An explanation, when I was a Puppy Linux developer, Puppy runs as root, so you never have to use sudo. And after using it for so many years, sudo is not muscle memory. So anytime I'm at the terminal, I just naturally assume I can do whatever I want, and there's nothing to stop me. So this happens all the time where I will try to run a command without sudo and it will fail. And then I realize I'm an idiot and run sudo. So do the make install, pop the stack again, back to rapid disk, do a make install. It works. And then I try to run it and, well, I can't. Well, first I tried, as you can see, well, or you can't see because the projector is bad. Uh, I tried to mod probe without sudo. Well, that's not going to work. You need, you know, root privileges for that. So I finally sudo that, get it started, go to start the process, and it fails. So I am not even one step in, and I've already had, you know, four or five failures that I've run into, but that's what makes Linux and open source fun, is figuring the stuff out and dealing with the challenge. <coughs> so I spent a good day fighting with this, trying to figure out why I couldn't get the service to start, because the error logs were not very helpful. They just said, hey, the server didn't start. So I filed a bug ticket, and then wait. And a day later, I get a message back from the developer going, well, it works for me. So in conversation with him, it turns out that Rapid Disk has two modules that you need to load in order for it to start. I was only loading one. Um, I have since then actually sent in a PR, which he's accepted to update the documentation. So hopefully no one will be as dumb as me the next time. Uh, it was not apparent to me that there were two separate modules. Rapid Disk will do a block device and also a disk cache so it can operate as either. And there's a separate module for each. And I didn't realize you have to load both modules even if you're only doing one. But all that's fixed. It runs. I sound like an idiot, but that's OK. This is for your entertainment. So let's just start over because everything before was kind of a mess. And we're not going to use the regular, or we're not going to use the minimal install. We're going to use the full regular 10 gig ISO from Rocky. And I'm not going to go through step by step. But basically, it works just like it's supposed to. Um, on line 10, not that you can see it on this projector, when I went to install the header file, it actually was included in the development package this time because I ran into an order of operations problem where I tried to install a package before having another repo installed, so it didn't work. But if you do it in the right order, it works. I mean, who would have thought that if you do things properly, they function properly? It's, it's a crazy notion, but that's where we are today. So we get it set up. We get it installed, we get it run, and it's working. So great, we need to configure our disk. So Rapid Disk has an interface, an API that you can use. Of course, it's nice and simple. Curl, really complicated. Everybody you know that's done anything on Linux for any pop period of time probably knows how to use curl. If not, read the man page. It's, it's about that complicated. So we curl the device, and I decide, well, let's just make a 240 gig RAM disk, because why not? I've got 256. I don't need 16 gig locally for the server to just sit there. This is the only thing it's going to do. So we do that. It's created. We get the block device, dev rd0. And of course, now, well, we've got our block device. Let's use, let's set up iSCSI. So if you have, have not ever used iSCSI before on Linux, 
and you want to configure it, you're going to need a package called target CLI. It's convenient, it works, documentation is pretty good. So we go through, we create our file IO, we create the LUN, we then have to create our IQN. This is all just basic iSCSI stuff for anybody who's done iSCSI. Uh, we set up our ACL, or we set up a LUN, we go to the backstores, we then uh, set up our ACLs. We have to get our initiator name from the workstation to then copy on to the target. We get that all set up and then start iSCSI D. So now we have the iSCSI running on the block device on the server. Yes, because Rapidisk is creating the block device that iSCSI is going to actually use. Okay. We're coming back there, but give me time, Joe. So iSCSI ADM, we do the discovery, and then we log in. If you want to know all the fun stuff about the actual iSCSI share, iSCSI ADM, and then the second line here is you can see all the details in case you want to do that. Uh, I'm not pasting that output here because it's too long and it looks bad on a, on a slide. So on the, once we actually do our login and we're connected, we do an FDIS to see if we have the disk. And sure enough, we do, dev SDE. So we have our networked RAM disk on one server at the end of a 15 meter fiber showing up locally as a disk because, well, iSCSI works. That's pretty much how that works. So we can check our swap, and we can see that, sure enough, on the workstation, we only have 32 gig of swap space. I can then use make swap and edit FS tab, restart swap, and I see that I have two swap devices now. I have my 32 gig local and my remote 20, 240 gig swap. Now, at this point, I mean, technically, we're done. We, we've, we've set out what we've set out to do, we have done. We have a workstation with almost 300 gig of swap space that no one ever thought anyone should have any business doing, which is probably true. But hey, we're doing it. Now, at this point, we're done. We have accomplished swap from one server to another server. But us being open source people, we want to actually test this. Well, at least I hope the people in this room would want to test it to see what kind of performance we get. So not format it as swap, let's go ahead and format it as XFS. Let's remove it from FS tab, make sure it's no longer there, reformat the system, and then mount it as a local drive. Now, as to why you would want a 240 gig RAM disk on your local machine, well, there's a lot of reasons that you might want that. I have a lot of reasons, but for the purposes of this talk, it's because I want to use it as a scratch disk, mostly for compiling. There's no reason for me to be hammering my, my you know, SSDs or my NVMe constantly to do compiles when I have RAM, which is super reliable and super fast. I say primarily because there are lots of other reasons that I could use this for, but we're not going to cover those now. That's a, that's a talk for another year. So compile time. As I'm an aluminum maintainer, I'm building that all the time, so let's just use that as our benchmark. So on my local NVMe, compiling all of the Lumina desktop, it completes in 1 minute and 42 seconds. It's not bad. It's pretty good. It's a small desktop. On a local temp tempfs mount that I'm doing on the workstation, it builds and it compiles in one minute, 33 seconds, and 470 hundreds of a second. So now the big reveal. On the networked RAM disk, one minute, 33.6 seconds. Um, at this point, I didn't really know what was going on, other than it was working. And it was working in a way I did not expect it to actually work. I did not expect that the local or the remote RAM disk was going to be faster than my lo local NVMe. I'm still not sure why that's working. So when I got these results, I was like, OK, I clearly, I screwed something up. I must have done something wrong. This shouldn't work. So reboot everything, make sure everything is configured properly again, run 10 tests each, throw out the highest and lowest, and then average the rest. And again, local NVMe is about a minute 42. Local tempfs is 1 minute 33.6. And the remote iSCSI RAM disk is 133.9. And again, I didn't think that's how this is supposed to work. Um, so the obvious question is, what is going on? Because this wasn't supposed to work. It was not supposed to work this well, I should say. 
it doesn't seem to make sense that another server at the end of a 15 meter line would actually end up being faster than my local NVMe. We're gonna try to dig into why, for those that are here and those that are listening, I don't know the answer, but we'll get to that. So if we're doing a compile, the most important thing, we're not doing a lot of bandwidth. We're not pushing a lot of bandwidth of files because they're just source files, they're text files. All of Lumina is about, with images that get built, is maybe around 400 meg. We're not taking advantage of the 400 or the 40 gig that we have. What we are taking advantage of is the latency because we're doing a lot of very fast reads and writes. Now, two meter cat 6e between the workstation and the server, if I do a ping, my average latency is 0.2 seconds. If I do it over the 15 meter fiber, it's 0.1 or 0.14. So basically cat 6e is 50% slower, which, I mean, that's kind of cool actually. You always hear that fiber's faster. We know it can do more with, but the fact that you know, we can see photons move faster than electrons. So if you ever doubted your science teacher in high school, they were right. So again, this wasn't supposed to work. To cover what's going on, let's cover our bases. So I wanted to mount the iSCSI volume over the one gig NIC and try, because I was like, maybe there's something weird going on with using the RAM disk. My computer's getting confused. It's lying to me. It's actually building on the local one and not going over the fiber. Let me actually do it on the ethernet because I can look and see the light blink. So I can see if there's actually communication going back and forth. So if I do the rapid disk block device over CAT6E, it compiles in one minute and 52 seconds. Again, if when I did it over fiber, it was 133. So networking actually does have an impact here. There is a difference between doing it over a one gig ETH and doing over 40 gig ETH. Um, and because no doubt someone at some point will ask me, well, hey, you used a 40 gig and you didn't show bandwidth metrics. I also did a copy of five copies of the Rocky Linux ISO to show you that yes, 40 gig is in fact faster than one gig. I would hope I wouldn't have to explain this, but I like my, cover my bases because I know certain people, I'm not gonna mention any names, Jeff, but he would totally point out to me later, you know, you should have covered this. So I covered this just for you, Jeff. You're welcome. So again, what is going on? How is this working? Well, I'll tell you. I don't know. I'm not sure how this is working. Basically, I tried to make a joke talk. Um, I knew it was going to work. I figured it would work very badly. It turned out that it worked well. So I guess the operation completed successfully as an error. Um, I succeeded while trying to fail. I'm not sure why a remote RAM disk over fiber is faster than a local NVMe. To me, that doesn't actually make technical sense. The local NVMe is over a it, uh, it's a by four PCIe Gen f three on that motherboard. The remote RAM disk is over a 16x, but it's still Gen three. But we're going out of the system and then into another system, and we're not using RDMA. So if we were in InfiniBand mode, which I'll touch on a little bit bit later, if we were in InfiniBand mode, we would be using RDMA. So the local would actually be, as far as actually doing request back and forth, would be seen as the remote would be seen as local. But we're not doing that. We're just using standard ETH right now. So for me, it makes sense that the RAM on my workstation would be the fastest. It does not make sense that the NVMe on my workstation would be slowest. So did I do something wrong here? Most likely, yes. What that is, I have no idea. And I have friends that do performance testing. Um, Nap, if you ever see this video, I am sorry for doing absolutely horrible performance testing. Uh, don't hate me, but I'm actually genuinely curious why this worked as well as it did. So I started as a, to make a joke. I failed at making a joke and found something odd, but I don't know why I found something odd and I don't know how it worked. So hopefully at some point in the future, somebody way smarter than me will be able to tell me why this worked because I don't think it should have worked that well. So someone in this room like Jeff, will surely raise his hand and go, well, hold on a second. In, in target CLI, there's a thing about, about a RAM disk. Yes, there is, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. So I didn't actually use think to test this at first because on FreeBSD, which is what I've normally used, 
for doing iSCSI shares. On FreeBSD, let me actually well, I have it up. For the back stores, the RAM disk is actually a null I.O. So it is only used for testing. So anything you write there is gone. So I didn't even think to test this on Linux. But then in doing my research and going through some documentation to try to figure out, okay, what on earth is going on here, I found out that no, it actually is a valid memory device. So let's just go ahead and see that for completeness. I don't know what else is going on, so let's just have some more fun and just poke around and do some random things. So rebuild the iSCSI share using the RAM disk that target CLI can create within the iSCSI daemon. Again, all the normal iSCSI things. Slides are online if you want to. You can look at them later. Or if you want to you know, try to reproduce this, feel free. So once that's all done, the iSCSI native block RAM disk over fiber compiled in one minute and basically 139. Um, again, the local NVMe was 142. Local tempfs was 133.6. And the remote RAM disk when we were using rapid disk was 133.9. Now as to why RAM disk through iSCSI was slower than rapid disk, I'm not entirely sure, but I have some ideas. For one, I think it's because we're using the Unix philosophy. An individual tool is doing an individual task. When we're using iSCSI to actually handle the disk and the communication and all of that, it's trying to do more than one thing. Whereas RapidDisk runs in the kernel. So iSCSI doesn't have to worry about any of that. It can completely hand that off directly to the kernel and the kernel file system, and it will handle all of that. That is my guess for why using the RAM disk within iSCSI is a little bit slower. Now, to be fair, we're only talking about five seconds. And if I'm really held captive by five seconds on my compile time, I have some serious life problems, and I need to rework my schedule severely. Um, you know, five seconds of gain on compiling something like this is not going to change the world. But again, I started this just to have fun and do something kind of stupid. So, as I mentioned, my original plan was to use InfiniBand because I have it, it's convenient, it gives me RDMA. But with these results, I didn't really see a point to even bother because I was getting speeds that were comparable with my local tempfs mount it's not really reasonable to assume I'm ever going to be able to improve on that, even using RDMA. So at most, I would be going from a minute 33.6 seconds, that's my, my local, 133.9, I've only got three tenths of a second to improve there. Again, my life is not such that three tenths of a second, shaving that off is really a win. Uh, maybe one of you, that's a big win in your life, um, if that's the case, I want to meet you because you live a crazy awesome life and I want to know all about it. Um, and for completeness, because I know my friend Jeff here will ask me later since I didn't in this talk, uh, th the RAM in my workstation is DDR4. The RAM in the server is DDR3. Um, I have the speeds in the server, it's PC4-1920 or 19200, and in the server it's PC3-14900 or 2400-1866 for those that normally know the numbers for ramdis, ramdims. Um, so yeah, I, I tried to be stupid. I tried to have a laugh. I discovered something that's actually kind of useful. And I, I don't know why, I don't know how, but there it is. So does anyone have any questions about anything I went over? Yes. So a couple years ago, um, when I was using, <coughs> sorry, when I was using uh, the ConnectX2 cards that were 40 and 10, um, I did an NFS mount. And I wasn't too impressed with the results, but to be fair, that was probably because those cards were only limited to 10 gig over ETH. And so there's the potential that the, the fiber that I was using for that network, it was a lower grade fiber. Um, there's a possibility that there's, you know, kind of a perfect storm of a bunch of things. The cards are older. The firmware, it was the latest firmware possible for those cards, but those cards have not been developed in a very long time. No software's come out. So there's possible that there were bugs and other issues in them. 
So when I went to do this one and I was using the newer generation of cards, it was, you know, I could do the NFS like I did before, but I had already done that before and I wanted to do something that was a little bit more stupid. Um, not to say iSCSI is stupid. iSCSI is, in my opinion, probably one of the best ways to do network shares. Um, I mean, for a home user, yeah, NFS probably makes more sense. Um, but most home users don't have enterprise servers hanging on their wall for an art piece. So I kind of felt like I needed to fit with lean into the, I have ridiculous stuff in my office. I'm going to do ridiculous stuff with it. Yeah, well, that was the plan. Yes, Jeff. Uh, more time. Uh, so for backstory, I usually do my slides for my talks, my talks for self the night before. Um, it's just kind of the thing I do. I actually like to, to get here, meet everybody, talk, and then that last night, once I'm finally in the mood of, okay, I'm you know, enjoying other people's talks, then I write my slides. This one wasn't going to be really possible because I would bring a whole little, little mini lab with me to do this, so I did this ahead of time. So I unfortunately had to kind of schedule it in other things in life. <coughs> so that is, that's kind of the reason. I do want to. The other problem is InfiniBand is one of those technologies that's kind of hard to figure out and learn because the use cases are very minimal. Only a few places will use InfiniBand. And you really don't need to know InfiniBand unless you work there. And if you work there, you're working with somebody that already knows InfiniBand and how to set everything up and how to configure it. So they're just going to tell you, oh, yeah, this is how we do it. So when you're coming in, you don't know anyone that does it for their day job. You don't do it for your day job. And you're just trying to figure it out on your own. It's actually exceedingly difficult to find all the documentation because what you will find is pretty much the engineering white papers and documentation like that written by Mellanox and they're writing it for the people that have been doing InfiniBand for years and already know it. So when you come in and you don't know it, you're like, okay, none of this means anything to me. So I've gotten InfiniBand up and running before and you can run IP over IB, IPOIB, to run standard Ethernet on top of InfiniBand. It works, it's a little slower because you're doing the translations. So if you have cards that do dual mode that will do ETH and InfiniBand, it makes more sense just to put them in ETH mode and, and go. However, if you want to use uh, iSEER, which is the RDMA extensions for iSCSI over InfiniBand, obviously you need to be in InfiniBand mode. And in digging through the documentation, I couldn't actually figure out, or I couldn't find any good documentation to help me figure out how you the initial handshake. Because in InfiniBand, you do not get a classic IP. Um, you get an identifier, which actually resembles more like an iSCSI IQN for your device. Um, so when you need to connect the, the systems up, you have to create the whole path. You have to create the route. Uh, you have to run a subnet manager. You have to do all that yourself. It's not nice and convenient and packed together with a nice little bow like Ethernet is. You're building it yourself. So when it comes to then doing iSCSI over IB, there's a complex handshake between setting up InfiniBand and then getting the iSCSI stuff to work. And the only references I could find showed the people using an IP to actually do the initial handshake and the login. And since there's no IP in InfiniBand, it, my question is, well, where is that IP coming from? Is that just another nick on the box? Are they running IB over IP to do the initial handshake and then disabling it? I don't know. And I couldn't find any ex explanation as to what that was because, again, it was written by people who already know what they're doing for people who already know what they're doing. So there's no reason to explain that. So I do want to do the InfiniBand stuff. I do want to do ICE here because, again, enterprise stuff is cool and I like to play with it. But I haven't figured that out. And it's just going to take a lot more time to reach out to people who do know this and convince them that my stupid idea on the weekend is worthy of them taking time out of their life to explain something that to them is very simple to me. So uh, since this will be online, if there's anyone watching this who knows that answer and how that goes, please reach out to me and let me know because I actually do want to know. And I will, I will do the fun stuff of documenting it so then other dumb people like me that want to do dumb stuff with enterprise gear have sort of a layman's guide to how I do it. Um, I mentioned earlier some of the stuff that I do. Those are the links. Uh, the slides are all on GitHub. Let me 
go back for my my chicken, my gladiator chicken. So if anyone is looking for these slides to look at later on their computer so they can actually see them and read them, unlike on the projector, they are right there. So are there any other questions? Go ahead. Okay, so the question was, uh, when I figure out how to do the infinite band stuff, is it going to go in this repo? The answer is yes and no simultaneously. So will it be in this repo? Yes, because that will be a follow-up talk. So it will not be in this slide deck, um, but it will be, like you can see, you know, uh, it's the talks repo and then it's the actual place and address. So all the talks I've given itself and other places are here. Um, so there will just be another entry. Um, so there will be at some point a swap as a service part two talk that I will give to follow up on this. And I will, I will strive to do more stupid with it because that's just me. Yeah, okay, so for the, the stream, recording later, um, the comment was made about doing more in-depth testing of different things other than just the compiles. Instead of just the IPERF, uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Right, because there is the possibility, and I, I totally acknowledge it, that I have just found the magic sweet spot where it works at its best possible situation. And I just happened to stumble onto that at the first chance. At the first thing I tried was just the best implementation. That's totally possible. Again, I don't think it should be that fast. As far as I'm concerned, it should have been a whole lot slower. So something happened. I don't know what. It's a mystery. And yeah, more testing would be better. That's why I apologize to NAP, which you know NAP. Uh, I mean, I guess. So on this board, since this was the hardware I was using, so this board has uh, 5068 IB on board. Now, this one cannot be put into Ethernet mode. This is IB only. But there is a convenient 16X slot right here. So I dropped in one of my PCIe cards for that. So I technically had two 40 gig ports I could use. But I didn't see any reason to lag them. That was another thing I was thinking of doing to be retarded is, hey, I've got two 40 gig ports on both sides. Let's lag them and get 80. But again, I'm doing a compile of a 400 meg repo. Yeah. There's, there's no point there. <coughs> okay. Mm -hmm. That's also going to fluctuate a lot based on the actual memory that you have and what the rate limit on the memory is. Um, and also just how this system decides to actually delegate that out to all the DIMMs. Yeah. Um, Rapid Disk is an interesting, interesting tool. Uh, I just did the surface level basic stuff with it because I just needed something quick and dirty. Because again, this was not meant to be, you know, I'm going to change the world. This was meant to be, this is really stupid and I'm going to have fun doing this. Um, but having gotten these results, yeah, there's definitely there's definitely investigation I want to do to try to figure out what's going on and why. Um, because I'm curious. I found something I didn't expect to find. 
that's kind of the beauty of what we do as geeks when we hack on stuff is we're just digging around, poking around, trying to find out what we can do, why we can do it. Um, and I found something that I found interesting. Another question, go ahead. What are the odds that, uh, that you, know, you decide to scale this up and actually start selling small little services to people who literally download land? Okay, so <laughs> the, the, the question came through of what if I you know, do more testing, this works, and I decide to scale this up and actually sell Swap as a service so people can download more RAM. Uh, it is a beautiful idea. Um, I think, I think I, by doing this talk, I believe I've secured copyright and trademark of this technology. Uh, so Google, hit up your boy, um, you know, send me a contract and we'll see what we can work out. Uh, I mean, there's no reason you couldn't do it longer distances, but you know, once you actually go out into the, to, to, ans at, mm, to answer your silly question as seriously as I can, uh, you know, you're going to have a problem with ISPs. I don't think most ISPs are going to be happy with, you're like, hey, I need a 40 gig pipe to my house that I'm going to be running constantly. I mean, maybe they'd like to charge you for it. I don't know. Uh, I don't have that capability where I live. Um, and I'm pretty sure Starlink is not going to give me that kind of bandwidth. So unfortunately, I won't be doing this at my house for other people. I can do it at my house for me. Um, through the podcast work I do, you know, I'm doing a lot of audio and video editing. And well, this actually works. So I can now use that as a scratch disk instead of constantly hitting my NVMe all the time when I'm doing exports. So. This actually has real world benefit for me. So that's cool. Um, it's always you know, nice when you're trying to do something silly and it's, oh, actually, hey, that's going to work. So any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for sharing in my stupidity. Um, I, uh, I hope you have been entertained. Yeah, here's